So, Roy Stewart, thank you very much for joining us at State of the Union. Um, we're delighted to have you with us. Former cabinet minister, academic, uh, explorer, diplomat, you've done it all. Um, can you tell us what is the State of the Union? I think, begin with the fact that I feel more worried about it than I guess we really have been for probably 300 years. The United Kingdom has really been for a very long time something that has richly embraced the idea of um, people being able to feel simultaneously Welsh, Scottish, English and British at the same time, uh, Northern Irish and British at the same time. It's done it very, very beautifully by allowing people to have two capitals, by allowing people to find two different types of identity. It's allowed people to be proud and define themselves against other members of the United Kingdom without wanting to break away from it. And that complicated but rather rich relationship seems to be breaking down. That's, it's really interesting. Um, had the leadership election gone differently in 2019 um, and you had been uh, prime minister right now, what would you be doing uh, to save the union? I think central to everything I was trying to campaign for was to put the union absolutely at the heart of everything we were doing. So if I'd been lucky enough to take over in, in July 2019, which is quite a long time ago now, so it would have been a year and a half by now, um, I would have started immediately by um, setting up a department for the union and doing some of the things that I feel the prime minister is now doing, but he seems to be doing them surprisingly late in the day. I mean, admittedly, he's had a lot on his plate, but... These were things that he and I discussed back in July, 2019, and I thought that he was gonna be getting on with as soon as he became prime minister. And above all, that's about making the United Kingdom matter in uh, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, making people see the point of being part of the United Kingdom. That's not just an economic thing. That's not just about investment. It's about identity. It's about relevance. So yes, of course, that's about having um, funds which you can spend in those places where people can clearly see a financial benefit. It's about partnerships and relationships, so uh, creating genuinely national institutions and exchanges to bring people together across borders. It's about spending a lot of time in those places, so I would have liked to be a Prime Minister who spent a lot of time outside England. And it's about, uh, I think, not just the business of convincing people in Scotland, for example, to care about the United Kingdom. It's also about convincing people in England to care about Scotland. I'm interested in uh, the point you make about a, a department for the union, because that's that's particularly topical at the moment with uh, Andrew Dunlop's reported conclusions uh, having come out last week uh, in part. What do you think uh, a minister for the union should be doing with their time? I mean, did you find in government that the case for the union was a little bit too fragmented because there wasn't a minister for the union uh, or that it just wasn't high enough your cabinet colleagues agendas because they didn't have that much to do with Scotland, Wales or Northern? Ireland and maybe didn't feel it was their job. Yeah, I think the, 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 there was a double challenge. I think there was the challenge that the Secretaries of State for Scotland, Wales, for example, um, had lost status over time, partly because the devolved administrations had taken a lot of their uh, roles and responsibilities away from them. So it was important to make sure that this thing had a much more senior central position at the cabinet table. It was represented very ably by people like David Liddington and people like Theresa May cared a lot about the subject, but there wasn't a single defined person doing nothing else. David Liddington had to do a number of other things at the same time. I think the, um, fundamentally, it, it did not feel as that around the cabinet table as though we spent enough time really focusing on this and investing in this. We didn't spend enough time in Scotland, I felt this even during the last referendum, that although eventually David Cameron's government came round to trying to belatedly make an emotional case for the union, they did it um, awkwardly and belatedly, and they largely focused on uh, the economic case rather than making any form of broader argument. So I, I just felt that um, people it's a sort of, it's an English failing. I mean, I sometimes feel that 
something about Westminster, something about uh, MPs with English backgrounds means that they're maybe just not as engaged, as, as curious, as, as absorbed in the issue. Is that, is that something that you found particularly as a, uh, an MP for a border constituency, that you understood uh, the way that people live their lives across that border, um, that, that gave you an insight that other, other cabinet colleagues and other ministers and MPs perhaps didn't have? Because if you look at, for example, the current cabinet, there's very few uh, Scottish or Welsh uh, voices uh, other than the Secretaries of State uh, for, for Scotland and Wales. And actually the increasingly increasingly English centric and, and sort of Midlands and Southeast centric uh, constituencies from which a number of ministers are drawn from. So do you think that that's, that's a systemic problem that maybe means that we don't understand uh, or government doesn't understand all the parts of the country as well as it should do? Well, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, it was a challenge, of course, when I came in in 2010, which was that there were basically no Conservative MPs. There was one MP who was my neighbour immediately across the border. Um, so that, that was the starting point of the problem. There wasn't enough presence. I think the second thing is that many of us, a um, surprising number of MPs in the Conservative Party are Scottish by ancestry or identity. But um, often I found my colleagues were concealing this because they were desperate to try to uh, win over their English constituency so they didn't emphasize so much I mean, it's obvious from their accents and, and, and their names that that's where they came from, but it was surprising how little they talked about it. Um, and very dramatic. I mean, obviously, you know, Michael Gove is very, very Scottish. John Stevenson, my colleague in Carlisle, very Scottish, and I, I could go on. Obviously, Alberto Costa, who's an MP down near Milton Keynes, is very Scottish. Ian Stewart. I mean, in fact, actually, we, we almost had a little uh, Stewart family clan gathering in the House of Commons. But... but really making something of that seemed to be surprisingly difficult. It's also very surprised about David Cameron because of course he actually, you know, is ancestrally Scottish. You know, he's descended from one of these great Scottish clan chiefs, couldn't be more Scottish. And yet oddly he described himself as English. I don't know what happened in his family history, but he seemed to lose all the romance and connection to Scotland somewhere along the way. Do you think, do you think on that point, there's an issue for the unionist parties where You've got a devolved structure now where the parliaments uh, across the nations have got real powers over people's lives. You know, they have influence far beyond what uh, an MP from the nations could possibly achieve on the back benches in Westminster. And yet the big figures prefer to look to SW1 rather than for power and potential in Cardiff Bay or Holyrood. I think that is a problem. I think that is a problem. Although that also is a healthy thing or ought to be a healthy thing. I mean, it ought to be a healthy thing that, um, I mean, if that wasn't the case, if Scots were not, um, you know, or, or Welsh uh, MPs or, or anybody were not feeling that the, um, the Parliament in Westminster mattered, that the British Civil Service mattered, then uh, nationalists would have an even stronger argument. Right? I mean, it's quite a strong, mm. strong argument against um, nationalism to point out that we've had an extraordinary number of Scottish prime ministers. I mean, the foreign office is dominated by Scots. The army is disproportionately dominated by Scots. So this should be a sort of argument for why Scotland actually plays an incredibly active part. I mean, I'm talking a lot about Scotland because I am a Scot, right? But I think you can make many of the same arguments for other parts of the United Kingdom. So rather than encouraging um, people to spend their time back in their own nation, I think it's important to show that people can flourish um, in the broader United Kingdom and not see it as a zero sum game. I mean, I think one of the problems with nationalism is it's very reductive. It's always saying, well, okay, who are you? Are you Scottish or are you English? You know, as though somehow there's an answer to that question when we all know that we are composed of multiple complicated identities and that's something to celebrate in a country like Britain. It's very dangerous, in fact. Nationalism is extremely dangerous because it's reductive. And I find this sometimes when I'm debating with Scottish nationalists, they're tempted to say, oh, well, you're not really Scottish because I have an English accent or because I went to a, a university in England. Um, but that's very dangerous because I then turn around and say, well, what is your definition of Scottish? I mean, I'm not Scottish. Right, what are you now gonna say about somebody from Poland in Scotland? Are they not Scottish? Right, clearly being Scottish must be simply a question of whether you wish to see yourself as Scottish. It can't be something that's based on some weird genetic decision or weird decision on the basis of 
where you've spent some of your time. Um, but that's very difficult because of course, by definition, half the Scottish population does not want to be independent or didn't in the last referendum. And yet that's something that Scottish nationalists find very difficult to understand. They imagine that there's a direct relationship between being Scottish and wanting independence. <laughs> what do you think the um, impact of the COVID pandemic has been on people's understanding of devolution with first ministers, mayors in England, um, having a much higher profile as a result of the public health messaging and also um, linking the powers that they hold to uh, the responsibility for delivering. Um, do you think it's increased the desire around devolution or do you think we might see a backlash against it? I think um, it, it's, it happened in two phases. I think the early part of the COVID pandemic where there were the complicated policy decisions about what to lock down and what to do and how to balance young people against elderly people tended to favor devolved governments. I think people like Andy Burnham did very well. To some extent, Nicholas Sturgeon did quite well on that stage. Uh, the second phase, which is the vaccination delivery, the United Kingdom government has done very well. And it appears that in that logistical uh, deployment, um, you know, Boris Johnson's government has sort of found its strength and Nicholas Sturgeon's government has struggled. And I think that actually tells you something about what devolution is good for and less good for. Um, and it's partly that what devolution is good for is working its way through a lot of the nuanced local issues and trade-offs around issues such as how and when and how quickly to lock down. Devolved government is very good when fundamentally it's about reassurance, communication, finding the local voice. But when it comes to doing these extraordinary negotiations which were done around the vaccine, which are about very, very complicated and incredibly expensive negotiations with pharmaceutical companies and with private sector people on deployment, then you see the role that a United Kingdom government has and ought to have and why it's quite good at doing that kind of thing. I'm, interest, I'm interested in one of the things that we've, we've talked about uh, through the newsletter in the last few weeks is, is how you make that case without it sounding like Westminster is, uh, is telling the devolved, uh, the devolved nations uh, that they don't know how lucky they are to be in this sort of separate thing that provides them army assistance as if it's foreign and uh, provides them vaccines that they couldn't possibly have got. How do you think you make that? Because it's a difficult case to make, particularly from, from a, a conservative, uh, heavily English-led government. It's not an easy case to make. I mean, I think people need to find their way towards a good uh, analogy or metaphor from their own life to understand that there are some things which are best dealt with on a very local level, and there are other things that are best organized on a, a bigger scale. Um, and I would want to try to say that Scotland, for example, I'm sorry, I keep coming back to Scotland, but as I say, I'm a Scot, so I understand it better than I understand Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, uh, is getting the best of all worlds, right? It gets the benefit of having uh, an intimate devolved government, of feeling a sense of national identity, while at the same time having what Denmark does not have, which is all the complexity, interest, muscle, diversity of being part of a country of 60 million people plus. And, um, you know, it's, It's an odd aspect of the modern world that I think it's partly that as we become more anxious about things, we prefer going small, we prefer simplifying. <clears throat> I think that what's happening here is, is a very understandable but very dangerous psychological tendency, which is when your life gets difficult and messy, you think the answer is to shut things down, to close off, right? So imagine you're having a difficult time, you might think the answer is to break up with your partner or you're having a difficult time with your parents, the answer is not to see them. You sort of retreat into your own little world. And you think that if you draw very clear boundaries around yourself, um, that's gonna make things better. That isn't the correct answer. The correct answer always in those situations is to reach out into that funny, ambiguous, messy relationship, to reach out into the world, not to try to simplify by reducing. Um, but that is an easier argument to make to people when they're feeling confident. And of course, there was a time when it was more obvious to people in Scotland that uh, Britain was an extraordinary place that brought great benefits, that there were real benefits to being able to be in the British army, 
to be in the British Civil Service, to be in the British Foreign Office, to be in the British Parliament, to go to British universities. Um, as, as people have lost their interest in those things, and that's partly because um, culture has changed in Scotland. Uh, people don't feel that aspiration anymore. They don't value those things in the same way. Uh, then it's more difficult to make the argument. Just touching on that and touching on the Fraser's point there about, about competence. Um, one of the things that you said you would have done had you been prime minister and spending uh, through the UK Share Prosperity Fund. Um, there's been um, a bit of um, a sort of argument held this week between the devolved governments and the UK government saying that this is a hidden assault, that uh, there's overreach from Whitehall. Do, do you think that's um, a case of people trying to take credit or do you think it's a case of um, them saying you've given us devolution, allow us to get on with it, allow us to have the money and we will be the ones that know how to spend it best. Well, the, the, the problem is that um, those conversations are much easier to have in a federal state like the United States where states are not trying to declare independence. So it's, it's perfectly comfortable to have those kind of arguments about where the correct place to locate something is in a stable situation. But the problem particularly in Scotland again, is that the SNP is deliberately using devolution and its control over assets to mount a continual drumbeat of argument for independence. So it's not a honest conversation, right? It's not, it's not an honest conversation about devolution. It's a conversation with people who are trying to use devolution as a cloak for a march towards independence. Uh, in that context, I think it's perfectly legitimate for the UK government to assert that there are things which should operate on a UK basis. And, and one of the things I think is that, I mean, amongst the many problems are firstly, uh, in the United States, the federal government is much more confident in asserting what is a federal responsibility and doing federal things in states and working out what those are. I think the second thing is that we have a problem with our civil service, which is that our civil service has tended to be extremely cautious about letting uh, the government in Westminster Whitehall get involved very much in what's happened. And I think the third thing is that we often devolved the wrong things and didn't devolve the right things. So just to give you one obvious example, I think it was complete madness to try to devolve a lot of the environmental forestry nature things. I mean, I really felt that right up on the border. Quite obviously nature doesn't stop at an artificial border between Northumbria and the Scottish borders. Right, air quality, water, forestry, wildlife, these things naturally should operate on a United Kingdom level. It's very bizarre to end up um, having devolved that down because that, that's really exactly the reasons why personally I want to remain in the European Union. A lot of that was about the fact that a lot of environmental issues work outside a particular state, but that's particularly true within an island when we have a single, single ecosystem, single biodiversity. Um, If, if I can just, um, I wasn't going to mention it, but since you did, uh, Brexit, um, not, to, not to rerun arguments over it, but it, it was a fundamental part of, of your pitch for the leadership. And um, I'm just interested as to what you think the impact has been, uh, the early impact uh, on the case for the union and, and the dynamics of the union um, in the first stages of Brexit. Is it better or worse than you thought it might be? Um, I think better or worse is difficult. I mean, it hasn't, the country has not broken up. Um, so in that sense, uh, it could be worse. I think that the impact has been dramatic in two ways. I think the first is that it's clarified uh, the differences, the cultural differences between people in Scotland and England. It's, it, it's produced a an issue where it's clear that the views of people in Scotland and the views of people outside London and England um, are dramatically different. And I think the second thing that's related to that is it's therefore given a very good um, excuse to the Scottish nationalists to demand a second referendum. They can say things have fundamentally changed, right, which they would not have been able to say otherwise. That, that will be a lot of their argument. If they get a referendum, it'll be 
we won a mandate in the May elections and this is not the same situation that we had before. Therefore, we are entitled to a referendum because the UK has left the European Union. The thing that um, is sad about all of this is that Scots are refusing to acknowledge one big central fact, uh, which is that, of course, London voted like Scotland. But instead of making people in Scotland feel that this gives them some common uh, identity with London, it, it, uh, they cherry pick. They use it when it suits them to say, that's why we're totally different to England and insist for other reasons that they hate London. Yeah, so we had a conversation <laughs> with, um, with Professor John Curtis a couple of weeks ago, and he told us that the um, biggest weakness that the unionists have um, across all of the research and polling that he's been carrying out is that there isn't a united message, that there's fragmentation between the Labour Party, the Conservatives, the Liberal Democrats, uh, and anybody else uh, you know, who believes that the union uh, should remain as it is. Um, how do you make the case for the union with our current politics? And, and how is, is the biggest risk that very fact that if you can't agree amongst yourselves, then the people who are united are the ones who are more likely to break up the union? Well, I certainly think a unity would be very helpful. There's, there's a problem. I mean, the, the problem is that the Labour Party has convinced itself of a, a story, which is really a myth, which is that by allying with the Conservatives in the Better Together campaign, they destroyed themselves in Scotland. Uh, Alistair Darling, I think, feels that he never got proper recognition or thanks for the role that he played in leading that campaign. And it suited the Labour Party to blame their losses in Scotland, which had many, many complicated reasons on that alliance with the Tories, just as it seemed clear to the Lib Dems that their big mistake had been to go into coalition with the Tories. That means, therefore, that it's very difficult to get uh, non-Tories now to sign up to a joint campaign in the way that they did a few years ago. So who's the figure? Who leads it next time round? <laughs> Well, I suspect what you need to do is make a much more popular, appealing, emotional case for the union. Uh, now, it, it's a paradox because effectively what I'm talking about is stealing some of the techniques of populism and putting it behind a very anti-populist message. Right? So <laughs> the message is basically uh, one of supporting the way things are Right? Populists are usually about change. Populists are usually about fighting for the people against the elite, so the SNP can steal most of that stuff. But where I think uh, this thing could learn from populism is that it shouldn't have a dry as dust, slightly boring technocratic leader. It needs somebody who can really excite people. Um, and that person should also ideally, if they can be, not be uh, particularly political. Now that's, that's, a diff that's, a, that's a really difficult set of things to put together. But what one needs to find is somebody who is a very, very able politician who passionately believes in the union, but who isn't uh, overly associated with trashing another political party. If only there was an independent former adventurer, explorer, who's no longer in politics, who cares for the union. Uh, I that's, can't that's think a of the idea. It's a lovely <laughs> idea. I, I, I was tempting with that idea is I think I have some very fundamental handicaps in, in this problem. I, I was, had an interesting conversation with, um, I was, had a, a very interesting hour debate with a, a young Scottish nationalist about a week ago, uh, where he said to me that one of the fundamental problems he has with me is when he hears me speak, he says that, Hearing a Scot speak like that, he says, it's like hearing a cat bark. <laughs> um, we're probably coming towards the end of our time with you, Marie. Um, just, just one final issue, which is um, a bit more contemporary. Have you been following the, um, the saga in Scotland this week with um, the Alex Salmond uh, evidence session, whether it will go ahead tomorrow or not, we will see. Um, is it an institutional problem for Scotland, what we're seeing? 
you know, the, the, there is a crisis that's unfolding between the judiciary, uh, whether justice can be done properly, whether scrutiny can take place, whether the devolved institution is actually up for the job that it's being tasked with. I think there is a good challenge there. I mean, I, let, let me just put in a little caveat, which is that there's obviously a lot of politics going on here. I'm quite amused by the fact that uh, some of my former colleagues who were gleefully saying that Alex Salmond was a, you know, a, a terrible sort of um, abuser and molester and harasser are now uh, asserting a few months later that he's completely innocent and has been totally um, sort of slandered by, by his enemies. So there is a bit of politics going on here, but I think your bigger point is right. I think there is a risk in Scotland that um, of elements of a, 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 in a gentle sense, a one party state, a sense that it hasn't fully settled down into the questions of where exactly the division of powers lies, um, that there aren't the full constitutional separations. And in it, it's a bit of a, and it's quite a small place. I mean, it's always a problem uh, in a small state that getting that right. And of course, the British institutions, the weird balances we have, the weird accommodations we have between how the Supreme Court works and Parliament works and government work, it is this weird, unwritten, evolved thing that we've taken three, four hundred years to get to. Um, so there is a bit of a, a risk in Scotland that um, everything becomes a little bit cosy. And, and that's something that you see in many other countries of similar sizes. I mean, one of the problems in in Edinburgh, it's literally everybody knows each other. It is a little bit too easy to pick up the phone and therefore the relationships are a bit too cozy between judges, police chiefs, senior politicians in a way that isn't true uh, in a larger place um, in the United Kingdom as a whole where, where, um, where firstly the rules are clearer, the conventions are clearer above all and those relationships aren't quite as cozy. It's not a smaller place. Chris, so I don't know if you have any, any final questions. The only question I wanted to finish on, Rory, was um, a lot of this conversation, we, we fall into a pattern of talking as if a second referendum is inevitable. Um, and it's sort of priced in that the SNP will uh, will win a majority of, of some kind in May. If they do, uh, do you think we are sliding inevitably towards a second independence referendum? Or do you think the government's position of just saying no and trying to uh, hold hold the line is sustainable? I think it's oddly very difficult to tell in advance. Um, this is a, a question of um, strange political prediction. I mean, all these things in, in Britain are um, ultimately to do with this very difficult question of what the public does. There's a moment at which politicians give in to the public. I mean, remember, you know, David Cameron for a long time tried to avoid having a referendum on Europe and eventually gave in. Um, and people still debate to this day whether he needed to or whether he didn't need to. And we certainly had the same discussion last time around with the Scottish independence referendum. Um, I'd only say though that Boris Johnson is in a slightly awkward position. And the awkward position is that he's a man whose entire prime ministership is predicated on the legitimacy of a referendum. It's therefore a little bit more difficult for him to make a high-minded argument against a referendum. Um, and particularly when Brexit is so central to the arguments being made around this referendum. I think he'll try and um, yeah, and a lot will depend ultimately on public opinion in Scotland and how it's sustained and what the media does as with any of these decisions. I don't think there's a, I mean, that's the weird thing about living in a country where we don't have a proper constitution. We can't, <laughs> these things are a judgment calls and um, but the risk is that were he to try to refuse, um, uh, of course, that it could make the situation feel very, very toxic quite quickly. Well, we'll, we'll be following those uh, those elections and the aftermath, <laughs> and perhaps speak to you afterwards when we know what the public have said. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all very much.